James Madison, father of the Constitution, warned, the means of defense against foreign danger historically have become instruments of tyranny at home. Abraham Lincoln had similar thoughts, saying, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. During war, there has always been a struggle to preserve constitutional liberties. During the Civil War, the right of habeas corpus was suspended. Newspapers were closed down. Fortunately, these rights were restored after the war. The discussion now to suspend certain rights to due process is especially worrisome, given that we are engaged in a war that appears to have no end. Rights given up now cannot be expected to be returned. So we do well to contemplate the diminishment of due process, knowing that the rights we lose now may never be restored. My well-intentioned colleagues ignore these admonitions in defending provisions of the defense bill pertaining to detaining suspected terrorists. Their legislation would arm the military with the authority to detain indefinitely, without due process or trial, suspected al-Qaeda sympathizers, including American citizens apprehended on American soil. I want to repeat that. We are talking about people who are merely suspected of a crime, and we are talking about American citizens. If these provisions pass, we could see American citizens being sent to Guantanamo Bay. This should be alarming to everyone watching this proceeding today because it puts every single American citizen at risk. There is one thing, and one thing only, protecting innocent Americans from being detained at will at the hands of a too powerful state, our Constitution, and the checks we put on government power. Should we err today and remove some of the most important checks on state power in the name of fighting terrorism, well then, the terrorists have won. Detaining citizens without a court trial is not American. In fact, this alarming arbitrary power is reminiscent of Egypt's permanent emergency law authorizing preventative indefinite detention, a law that provoked ordinary Egyptians to tear their country apart last spring and risk their lives fighting to overcome tyranny. Recently, Justice Scalia affirmed this idea in his dissent in the Hamdi case, saying, where the government accuses a citizen of waging war against it, our constitutional tradition has been to prosecute him in federal court for treason or some other crime. He concluded, the very core of liberty secured by our Anglo-Saxon system of separated powers has been freedom from indefinite imprisonment at the will of the executive. Justice Scalia was, as he often does, following the wisdom of our founding fathers. As Franklin wisely warned against, we should not attempt to trade liberty for security. If we do, we may wind up with neither. And really, what security does this indefinite detention of Americans give us? The first and flawed premise, both here and in the badly misnamed Patriot Act, is that our pre-9-11 police powers were insufficient to combat international terrorism. This is simply not borne out by the facts. Congress long ago made it a crime to provide or to conspire to provide material assistance to al-Qaeda or other listed foreign terrorist organizations. Material assistance includes virtually anything of value, including legal or political advice, education, books, newspapers, lodging or otherwise. The Supreme Court sustained the constitutionality of these sweeping prohibitions. And this is not simply about catching terrorists after the fact, as others may insinuate. The material assistance law is, in fact, forward-looking, preventative, and not backward-looking and reactive. Al-Qaeda adherents may be detained, prosecuted, and convicted for conspiring, for attempting to violate the material assistance prohibition before any injury to any American. Jose Padilla, for instance, was convicted and sentenced to 17 years in prison for conspiring to provide material assistance to Al-Qaeda. The criminal law does not require dead bodies on the sidewalk before it strikes at the international terrorism. Indeed, conspiracy law and prosecutions in civilian court have been routinely invoked after 9-11 to thwart embryonic international terrorism. Michael Chertoff, then head of the Justice Department's Criminal Division and later Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, testified shortly after 9-11 to the Senate Judiciary Committee. He underscored that, the history of this government in prosecuting terrorists in domestic courts has been one of unmitigated success and one in which the judges have done a superb job in managing the courtroom and not compromising our concerns about security and our concerns about classified information. 
Moreover, there is no evidence that criminal justice procedures have frustrated intelligence collection about international terrorism. Suspected terrorists have repeatedly waived both the right to an attorney and the right to science. Additionally, Miranda warnings are not required at all when the purpose of the interrogation is public safety. The authors of this bill errantly maintain that the bill would not enlarge the universe of detainees eligible for indefinite detention in military custody. This is simply not the case. The current authorization for use of force confines the universe to persons implicated in 9-11 or who harbored those who were implicated in 9-11. This new detainee provision would expand the universe to include any person said to be part of or accused to be part of substantially supportive of al-Qaeda or Taliban. Be aware though that these are people who are accused of, not proven to be, but suspected to be or accused of. These terms are dangerously vague. More than a decade after 9-11, the military has been unable to define the earmarks of membership in or affiliation to either al-Qaeda or other international terrorist groups. Some say that to prevent another 9-11, we must fight terrorism with a war mentality and not treat potential attackers as criminals. For combatants captured on the battlefield, I tend to agree. But 9-11 didn't succeed because we granted the terrorists due process. 9-11 attacks did not succeed because al-Qaeda was so formidable, but because of human error. The Defense Department withheld intelligence from the FBI. No warrants were denied. The warrants weren't even requested. The FBI failed to act on repeated pleas from its field agents, agents who were in possession of a laptop with information that might have prevented 9-11. These are not failures of our laws or our Constitution. They are not failures of procedure. They are failures of imperfect men and women in bloated bureaucracies. No amount of liberty sacrificed on the altar of the state will ever change that. A full accounting of our human failures by the 9-11 Commission would have proven that enhanced cooperation between law enforcement and the intelligence committee, community, not military action or sacrificing our liberty at home, is the key to thwarting international terrorism. We should not have to sacrifice our liberty to be safe. We cannot allow the rules to change to fit the whims of those in power. The rules, the binding chains of our Constitution were written so that it didn't matter who was in power. In fact, in fact, they were written to protect us and our rights from those who hold power without good intentions. We are not governed by saints or angels. Our Constitution allows for that. This bill does not. Finally, the detainee provisions of the Defense Authorization Bill do another grave harm to freedom. They imply perpetual war for the first time in the history of the United States. No benchmarks are established that would ever terminate the conflict with Al-Qaeda, Taliban, or other foreign terrorist organizations. These are not temporary losses of freedom. These will be permanent losses of freedom. In fact, this bill explicitly states that no part of this bill is to imply any restriction on the authorization of use of force. No congressional review is allowed or imagined. No victory is defined. No peace is possible if victory is made impossible by definition. To disavow the idea that the exclusive congressional power to declare war somehow allows the president to continue war forever at a whim, I will be offering an amendment this week to deauthorize the Iraq war. Use of military force must begin in Congress with its authorization and it should end in Congress with its termination. Congress should not be ignored or an afterthought in these matters and must reclaim its constitutional duties.